Uh, yeah, that is a fundraiser for the uh, for Daniel Shavara, the the our China missionary. So, you know, he's out there. Been out there for a while now. How many guys know Daniel? Do you guys remember when he came and shared here? Yeah, he was here a while back. We had him share a little bit of his uh, testimony and what the Lord's doing there. Kind of a cool, a whole cool story. I've known Daniel for a long time, and it's neat to see him and take his wife up and go, man, just straight up to another country. So they're they're busy down there and they're doing a lot of work and the Lord's using them in that in a place where you know he can't really publicize what he's doing. So they got to be all kind of secret Jedi, you know, whenever they talk about the work that's there. Um, but just pray for him, you know, most importantly, uh, you know, when you guys think about our missionaries from Downey uh, and their families, he's out there just having a family, man. He's having babies out there and everything, man, you know, and raising his kids in, in another country. So, uh, so yeah, and then they're going to be there after the study for you guys at like second or third dinners, which is cool, you know, and you guys could go out there. They'll be out there for a while. Um, so welcome to Thursday night, man. Another Thursday night goes by. Uh, it's good to see you guys, man. It's uh, not always easy getting down here. You know what I mean? Uh, the enemy just hates the fact that we want to come and hear the word on Thursday night. And he makes every reason for us not to be here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's really, when I say that, man, it's really a blessing being here with you guys. And it's been a blessing going through the book of Genesis now for the last, it feels like the last seven or eight years. And, you know, it's just, and I, and I, don't know when we're going to end, <laughs> you know, and I was telling somebody recently, I'm really not going to have any idea what to do once we finish that last verse in Genesis, man. And then he's like, well, just go to Exodus. I'm like, dang it. I don't know, man. So it's been a, it's been a pretty cool journey. I'm glad that you guys have been engaged in reading the book of Genesis. I think most of you, when I talk to like you guys, I, I know most of you have finished Genesis and have studied it on your own, and it's just an incredible book of the Bible. It has so many solid, fundamental, uh, foundational truths that exist throughout the rest of the scripture. And so it's been really cool, man. And I just love, we've been taking our time going through the story of Joseph because that's just one of the most incredible stories in Genesis. I, I just feel like the life of Joseph is just amazing, and it applies to us on so many ways. So tonight, we're going to read... Okay, so we're going we're gonna to bust out the chapter, man. At least that's the way it looks right now. I'll watch the clock, and if something changes, then we'll go from there. But uh, it's kind of one of those chapters that I think you just have to read it, the whole thing. I don't know. We'll see. Let's pray and ask the Lord to, to go before us tonight. So, Father, we thank you for your presence, Lord. We thank you for uh, the fact that you are light, and you are all-loving. You are all-knowing. And Lord, help our perspective tonight to be one of you that is correct, seeing you in the right perspective, in the fullness of your glory. You don't, you don't, you're not confused. You're not out to hurt us. You're not uncertain. Lord, you are all knowing. You have everything planned. You are the author and finisher of our faith. And so we pray, Lord, that your word tonight would come to us as truth. And that would, we would receive it like that. So revive us, Lord, tonight in our hearts. Encourage us in our spirit if we're down, Lord, and help us to hear you. And as we, as we pray, we pray, Lord, that you would give us something that's relative to our life and practical to our life. Lord, that's why we're here, to hear from you about something regarding us. So speak to us in a personal way tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, man. So we are going to go ahead and go with chapter 44, right? Chapter 44, man. And uh, yeah, slow down. I'm really getting, getting fast already, isn't it, man? Dang, bro. Chapter 44. Let's start at verse 1 and see where we go from there. Uh, and it'd be something if we just stopped at verse 1, man. It'd be something. All right, chapter 44. Well, let, let, me, let me first back up for a second, all right? Here we are with... with uh, <laughs> oh, you're saying, no, 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 don't back up, man. See, I, I already felt like I was going too fast already, bro. <laughs> I felt like it was done already. Uh, <laughs> hey, real quick, real quick. All right, follow me on this, man. Because uh, this is a crazy story, man, all right? Joseph is about to... 
we're, we're building up to the point where he's about to reveal himself, man. All right? So these guys have just been, we got to take it slow, man. We got to take it slow. All right, verse one, here we go. And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, fill the men's bags with food as much as they can carry and put every man's money in his bag's mouth. It's a King James version. And verse two, put my cup, the silver cup, watch this, in the, the bag mouth of the youngest and his corn money. So, so here's Joseph now, okay, instructing his servant. Now, some of you probably already have studied this. Do you guys know if his servant is Hebrew or Egyptian? Anybody? He's Egyptian, huh? That makes this whole story much more insane, man. Uh, so notice though, here, here's the point. I, wanted, I, I ought to draw this out right now before we keep going in the chapter because this verse right here kind of sets the precedence for the tone of what's taking place in this whole chapter. Notice he says, put the cup in the youngest. In the youngest, which is who? Benjamin, okay? So Joseph is turning his sights to Benjamin. Why? Why is he right off the top here in our chapter going to start targeting Benjamin for something? I personally think, and I think it's going to be noted through the chapter, I think Joseph wants to know, will they stand with Benjamin or will they let him go as they let him go? Will they stand with Benjamin, the youngest, or will they just dodge him and say whatever with Benjamin the same way they treated Joseph many years ago? I think he's curious. How are they going to treat him? Are they going to treat him like they treated me? And so I think that is going to be the theme of this, of this chapter. And why is he curious to know this? Why does Joseph want to know? Well, he wants to know if they changed. Has something changed in my family? Has something changed in their hearts? They used to be this way, and now they're acting this way. Has something genuinely changed? You know, when God is at work in the lives of his people, when God is at work in our lives as his people, one of the common examinations that take place in all of our lives is, is your heart changing? Is your, is your family's heart changing? Is your wife's heart changing? Children, I mean, is your situation changing your heart or not? That's examination one. We have to examine our hearts. And so I think that's what Joseph's doing here. He's doing a good old fashioned, what God does all the time. Is your heart changing? It's something we got to really talk about. We have to, that's why the Bible says to examine your heart. I have to ask you this question. If you're going through something tonight, has God changed your heart? Do you feel your heart changing? Has, has God begun to, to move in, in your family or your situation? Those people that are involved, do you see a change happening? That's why God allows these things to happen. And that's why he, he does these things. To show us who we are. To show us those things in our lives that he doesn't want anymore. Transformation has to happen in the believer. And for the believer who's lived a life that maybe is a little distant from God. That for the believer who's maybe lived a kind of a standoffish life. Well, God's going to draw you close. And the only way you're really going to get in there is if you start changing your heart. So jo Joseph is using this, what I like to call this character attribute of God. He, this is God's attribute. This is God's character. Every one of us in this room should expect at some point in time for God to examine our hearts and to show us that. Every one of us. It's going to happen in your life. If you call yourself a professing Christian, one who comes to church, sings songs to the Lord, reads the Bible then a heart examination is on its way, okay? So he's going to put the silver cup in Benjamin's bag because he's going to want to see how they're going to treat Benjamin. Have these dudes changed at all? Notice, let's go to verse 3. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. And when they were gone out of the city and not yet far off, so here they go, he, he's already, they're leaving. Joseph said unto his steward, up, follow after the men, and when thou dost overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? Is not, th is not this in which my Lord drinketh, and the cup again, and whereby indeed he divineth, I've had done evil in so doing. Now, kind of a weird thing happens here about this cup. Joseph basically is 
you have to, I guess we kind of have to understand a little bit about Egyptian culture and back then and how they, how they really emphasized their gods and all of their religious practices. So it's, history would say that the Egyptians held, you know, these types of bowls and cups and things like that, these different types of vessels, they held them real divine. You know, they, they used to treat these objects as ways to, um, who, uh, ways to communicate to gods, ways to perform miracles. Way, that's what those guys, Jonas and Jambres, you remember those guys that were going up against Moses? And they had their little things. They would mix stuff in and they were making the little water turn into blood through these jars and all this stuff. So it was something common of that time. The culture used these types. And, you know, honestly, it's common of our time today. There are a lot of religious groups out there today that use vessels and things like that as a way of saying this vessel, this uh, artifact or this piece of material is my channel to God. And so, so it isn't just that he's saying, oh, they stole my cup. You know what I mean? This is something he wanted them to know was very serious. You took my cup of divination. You took my source of how I communicate religiously. Now, is that true for Joseph? No, this is not what he uses to tell dreams. And we know he was in the dungeon when Pharaoh's butler and Baker were in there. He, he just, God gave him a revelation. He didn't use a cup to figure it out. So let's not get weird and say, well, Joseph used cups, man. You know, I guess I maybe might want to try something and see if I could perform some kind of divination. No, he didn't use this. This is not what he was doing. This is just him speaking uh, in terms of the culture at that time. And so he wanted the brothers to feel like, man, they, they done messed up. He, they, we took his cup of divination. Oh my gosh, Benjamin, you know, it had to be serious. He, you're me, you mess with the Egyptian uh, and his gods, it's punishable by death. You mess with, and especially you being a foreigner, okay? You being a foreigner, it's bad enough. But these two groups of people hate one another. They don't, we read last chapter, they don't even eat dinner with each other. The Hebrews and the Egyptians, they don't even sit at the same table because it would be a disgrace. Let alone a Hebrew steal one of their, you know, important religious artifacts. Oh, it's punishable by death for sure. So Joseph knew to make this scene really bad. He had to build it up extremely. He had to make it one of those things where, oh, I want to make them feel it. You know what I mean? So that's what's going on here when he says in verse 5, you know, uh, and whereby indeed he div divineth. He's talking about you took my my, you know, religious artifact, man. And not that he did it. It's just using the culture for this scenario that we're getting into. So, uh, and he's challenging them. So you guys have done wrong. I've treated you good. You guys have treated me evil. All right. So verse six, and he overtook them and he spake them these same words. And they said unto him, okay, so here, here they go. Wherefore saith my Lord these words? You know, why, why are you saying that we would do this, man? Uh, God forbid that thy servants should do according to this thing. Uh, notice, look at verse 8. Here they go. Behold, the money which we found in our bags, mouths, we brought again unto thee. They're going back, okay? Out of the land of Canaan. I, well, we had the money back at home, and we brought it back to you. How then should we steal out of thy Lord's house silver or gold? What they're doing here is interesting. It's very common for people to do when they're put in this situation. They are trying to prove their, their, their own integrity. That's what they're doing. Hey, why are you saying this about me? Don't you remember? We just recently had your money, but we brought it back. You see, God's work. Now notice, this is kind of an important but interesting point. God's work, because this whole story we know is God's work, right? We can agree this is all of God's work. God's work can sometimes seem contradictory to our expectations. See, this whole thing is God's work in their lives. So for these guys to have to defend themselves, they're defending themselves against God's work. God is the one who allowed Joseph to do this. God is the one who allowed all this to transpire. We know that God is using this entire situation. But in their perspective and in their eyes, it's contradictory to everything they are. It's contradictory to everything they're expecting. They expected to come back to Egypt and just be able to make this transaction really quick, give the money back, get their brother and go home. That was their expectation. That's what they thought was going to happen in this situation. But now that's not what's happening. This situation is turning totally a whole nother route. 
We have to, we have to take that for a moment and, and sit on that. Why? Because guys, don't we all have expectations? We all have expectations about our situations, every one of us. If you're going through something or if you've gone through something or if you're just pondering and contemplating something in life, you have an expectation. You do. We have to. That's we're men. We, we think this is going to happen if I do this. Or this should happen if I do this. If I go to church more, maybe God's going to, you know, get a little bit more involved in my life and things are going to go good. That's an expectation. How many of us have been there? Things get weird. All of a sudden you're reading the Bible more than you ever have. And your expectation is, well, if I read the Bible more then maybe that means God's going to do a little bit more in my life. You know, that's an expectation. But what happens when the expectation is, is not there and not met? And actually your situation gets a lot worse. What do you do? Who do you become? What type of reaction do you have when your expectation is basically flushed down the toilet and now God is doing something that you never even expected? And in fact, it's, it's the opposite of what you would have expected. A lot of the times, that's when people freak out, to be honest with you. People leave the Lord. They walk away. They can't take it. They don't understand it. We say, you know, why, why is this happening? I'm doing good. Uh, how could this be? I, I thought I was supposed to get some kind of, some kind of, well, don't you reap what you sow? Isn't that what the Bible says? And I'm, I'm reaping good right now. So why am I, why am I not sowing any good? Uh, I, I, I've heard of so many guys that have marital problems and I've heard them, man, I, I, I'm, I'm doing this for her and I'm doing that for her. And, and, you know, I, I went and bought her this and I, and then she just not even talking to me, man. And their expectation is not being met. They're like, dude, I'm, I'm trying to do good, but nothing is in return. That's what's happening with these guys right now. They're like, wait a minute, man, we've been doing good. We thought we were doing good. And now what's happening here? You know, this, this isn't us. We, we brought the money back. How, why would we steal from you? You know, I believe that it's, it's at those moments, it's at these moments right here, when our expectations aren't met, when life isn't going the way you think. Actually, let me, let me rephrase that. When God isn't being the God you think he should be, when that happens, who do you become? What do you do? How do you perceive the Lord? I was doing a, um, a devotion this morning with our staff, and <clears throat> I talked about the scripture that says in first John one, where it says, uh, God is light and in him, there is no darkness, right? Simple verse, man, simple verse, but so hard to understand. God is light and in him is no darkness. That's it. God is light and in him is no darkness. So if we were to perceive our situation in the lens that God is nothing but light, then you would know that then there's no darkness in him, then everything about my situation will be nothing but good, no matter what happens, because in God, there is nothing but light. There is nothing but love. There's nothing but goodness. But what happens with us, man, is <clears throat> we kind of develop our own definition of who God is, and we add a little bit of our own opinion in there. Well, yeah, God is good, but right now this is happening. Oh, God is good, but I think he's maybe not hearing me right now. I know God is good, but I think he's just, you know, pounding me right now. I'm under the chisel time. When you add that little but God thing, you're adding darkness to the light. You're adding something to his perfect character, something that's human, something that's, that's being defined by your, or let me say it's being, it's defined by the influence of your situation. We do that all the time. We define God based upon our circumstance and the influence of it. So if you're feeling like, man, God is just disappointing me. Well, now you're defining God as somebody who disappoints. That's not him. He doesn't disappoint. He comes in at the right time all the time. He never disappoints. Well, he didn't come in the time that I wanted him to, so I'm disappointed. Well, that was your definition of God because you set an expectation and you let that, what happened to you, define God. No, that's not true. God is light only. So you see, we have to challenge ourselves, man, to see our life and our situations in who God really is. The God of the Bible. Who is he? Not to you. Don't say who is God to me. Who is God according to the word? I was telling the guys earlier that this year's men's advance, I think we're going to 
probably title it something around those lines, God, the God of the Bible. Because I really believe what happens today, and the enemy uses this all the time, is we start defining God for who he's not. And we do that based off our emotions, you know. So in order for men to be given power, in order for us to be given tools for victory, we first have to understand who God really is. Who is the Lord according to the Bible? Not according to your experience, not according to how you feel, not according to what you think as a kid, you saw God in the cartoon or something like that. No, who is the God of the Bible? And if we truly understand who the God of the Bible is, then when these situations happen like this, where things, your expectations start getting kind of shoved off the shelf and things start looking backwards, it's not going to matter to you. It's not going to trip you up like it would in another time. Because you're going to say, well, the God of the Bible is in control because he says he's in control. Well, the God of the Bible says that, that um, he's going to start the work that he finished. So then I need to rest in that. Not in my truth. Not in my experience. Not in my definition of who God is. But the God of the Bible and so what they're doing is common. They're saying, man, they heard they've been accused. Their expectations are being shot out. And so they're defending themselves. I thought, you know, I thought we've been doing good. How can you say we're doing bad? Look at what happens in verse 9 now. So, with whomsoever of thy servants it be found. So whoever, man, if you're accusing us of this, whoever it's found among, both let him die. And we also will be my Lord's bondmen. That's an interesting scripture, okay? So they're shooting themselves in the foot right now, man. That's what they're doing. Don't we all do that? They're saying, look, we didn't steal this man, all right? And if you find it in our, on our property here, kill him. And then we'll all be your slaves. That's what they're saying. You know, I, I just got to say this. Like, when God is at work in our lives, like he's at work in their lives, try not to take confidence in the flesh, okay? Take no confidence in the flesh, because if you start to take confidence in the flesh, like, you know, I know I'm good, man. I got this. I haven't done anything wrong. Self-justification, right? I haven't done anything wrong. Well, what if God snuck a cup in your bag and you didn't know it? And you're standing there going, I ain't done nothing wrong. I know it. Guys, we got to be careful to not be confident in ourselves. Okay? The Bible tells us that the, in, in man, in this flesh, dwells no good thing. No good thing. I don't know how many translations we can say that. In you and me dwells no good thing. Well, what do you mean, bro? I, I gave that homeless dude at the gas station like three bucks the other day. So there's a good thing in me. What do you mean, man? I bought my chick some roses last week. Yeah, that was good. What do you mean, man? I, I ate good today. I ate salad for lunch. You know? Let me just say, say, let me just tell you what the Bible says. Take it however you want. The Bible says in you, there's no good thing. Okay. But let me say this much on that note. There is a good thing in us. Um, and it's not a thing. There's a good person in us. And that person's name is Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, that person's name is not Phil Marino. Okay. Because if it's up to me, I'll... I'll I'll tell you, if the Lord is looking through my eyes, I'm already guilty of so many things today. Okay? So the only good thing in me is the Lord. And everything else is just rotting. Okay? <laughs> At so many levels. And so let's not take confidence in ourselves. The only confidence that we have is in the Lord. And he wants to be your only confidence. That's the thing. And, for, and you know what's interesting is I believe God does this. For those of us who feel like there is good in us, he lets you fail more. So that way you eventually go, oh gosh, man, there isn't anything good. Lord, you are the only good thing in me. So we're perfect, right guys? In the sight of God, right? Why? Because of Jesus. But let me just remove Jesus out of you real quick. What do you look like before God? <laughs> you know? Filthy rags, according to what the Bible says. That's just what the Bible says, not me. But we are to be holy as he is holy. We are, uh, he says, we were as filthy rags. But you see, we are made white as snow now because of him. So guys, be holy as he is holy. And, and, and rejoice in that being made white as snow, as he says in Isaiah chapter 1. For your sins were as scarlet. You know, they were 
they were stained on you, but now you're purified and you're made clean. And we rejoice in him for that. So here they are, though, they're doing the normal. They're saying, hey, man, if you find something in me, man, kill me, bro. If, if you find that we did this, kill me and we'll be your slaves. Hey, careful, man, careful. You don't know what God's doing. And they're going to find out very soon. Verse 10. <clears throat> and so he said, now also let it be according unto your words. Okay, all right, I'm good with that. I'll take your word. If I find something, then I get to kill you. Good. He with whom it is found, if I find this cup, shall be my servant, and ye shall be blameless. And so they're like, okay, cool, let's do this. Verse 11. So then they speedily took down every man his bag to the ground, and they opened every man his bag. And there they are standing all confident, right? And verse 12. And he searched, and he begun at the eldest. Look, he knew where it was. This servant knew it was in the youngest. So he said, let me, let me, let me, let this, let me draw this out for a minute. Let me start at the oldest one's bag. And I'm just going to work my way down. And, you know, I bet it was really interesting. I bet you every time he opened the one, they stood there like, like, yeah, see, told you, man. Ain't nothing in mine. Next one, cut it open. See, nothing there. You see, they're probably looking at him like, see, we're blameless, man. Come on. Starting at the oldest and left at the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's bag. Can you imagine how they felt at that moment? All the way down, all the brothers standing there confident. See, we told you, servant of Joseph, man. And then all of a sudden, they're probably even grabbing their bags when he got down to Benjamin's like, all right, come on, let's get ready to go, man. He's not going to find it. Cut it open. Bing, here it falls out. The cup. Joseph's cup, man. At that point, you know, you have to say something like, yeah, God's ways are not our ways. What if, what if, what is going on here? How has this situation turned so bizarre? We've done nothing. All we're trying to do is get food for crying out loud. And this thing has turned into God knows what. I, I read this and I say, you know, isn't life like that? We sometimes we're just trying to go about life. We're trying to do what we're supposed to. We're trying to live how we're supposed to live. And we're trying to even get close to God, aren't we? That's why we're here tonight on Thursday night. It doesn't sometimes life just feel like Benjamin's bag. All of a sudden, just a wrench is thrown in there. And you're like, how did that happen, man? Like, what, have I, what did I do? Lord, I, what have I done? You know, how, how come this is going on? I, I really like that because Every one of us can relate to that. And you know what, guys? The reason why that happens in life, I believe it's very biblical, is because God's ways are not our ways. And the Lord is the only one who knows the exact situation to bring in all of our lives that's going to make you feel it. He's the only one. Yeah, I don't know what's going to make you feel pressure. I don't know what's going to make you come to church. You know, you, if we knew that, this place would be packed, wouldn't it? If God revealed to the pastor what, how to make every guy come here, trust me, we'd be in our offices poking dolls and junk and, you know, having this place filled up, you know, all night long. God only is the one who knows. And everyone in this room, you, you, you know, and you may not even know until it happens, until God pushes that right button in your life that you didn't see coming. You didn't see it happening. You thought you were fine. You thought everything was going good. And then he all of a sudden cuts the bag open and the cups in there. And you're like, how on earth did this just happen? God knows what to do. And he does that to bring you to this place. So say, I know. Look, I always tell everybody that I talk to that are going through things. I'm always like, look, if you didn't feel it, then it wouldn't be real. It's, you feel it because it's real, man. Because God knew what you would perceive as real. So he knew which one to touch. He knew which, he knew which bag to cut. He knew how to do this because, and, I, and I've gone through that, and I'm still going through it. Where I, I have stood in many nights and said, Lord, only you knew how to get my attention this way. Living my life just fine. As a pastor, studying the word, raising my children, being there with my wife working in the church and the Lord is the only one who knew what to push in my mind that would get my full attention 
and he still has it till this day. I feel like I have a handicap now. You know, I'm, I'm in bondage to this thing that I deal with. And, I, and, I, and I, it's a stronghold from God. And that's all I could say about it. And I rejoice in it more now because I'm focused on him 24-7. As opposed to before, I was focused on him maybe four hours of the day. Now I feel like I can't live a minute without the Lord. And so only he knows how to do that. Only he knows what to do in your life to make that happen. And so we thank God for that. But it's something that you have to understand tonight. As we read this story, they don't know what's going on, but we do because we're reading it and they're already with the Lord and we're way here in the future and we can find out it was God doing something here. We know that now. We know that, but they don't know that. But we know that. So, verse 13. They rent their clothes and laid at every man his donkey and returned to the city. They threw themselves to the ground, man. They exploded in mourning, in fear. See what I'm saying? They reacted in dread, in angst. And I want to say, that's what happens when your expectation fails. <laughs> when you finally let yourself down to the fullest degree, normally this is your response. We cry. We mourn. We're shocked. I, I'm, I'm desperate now. I, and, and now from going from just the guy that walked in the church and maybe sitting down on Sundays and walking out, you're the guy going up to, hey, pray for me, bro. You want to pray for me right now real quick? You got time? You know, hey, man, I, I need a word. You got a word for me? Before someone come to you, hey, let me give you a word. Hold on, man, hold on. Hey, hello, what's up, guys? You know, now give me a word, man, give me a word. Now you're desperate. You're desperate for the Lord. You're, 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 you're yearning to hear from God because you have... You, you have you have experienced great failure. It's part of the process. It's part of what God does. And he brings us to a place of being desperate for him. Does he not say that he wants us to, to just, we are to be men of prayer, right? All day long. We're supposed to be seeking the Lord. And we hear those verses, right? And we say, how am I going to ever get to that point? I'm not that kind of guy, man. I mean, you know, how am I going to get to that point where I'm like that brother who's just always worshiping and seeking the Lord and seems like they got a really cool relationship with God? How am I going to get to that point? Well, God knows how to get you to that point, okay? And oftentimes, the way to that is usually through heartache, unfortunately. You know, I always say that one scripture, uh, sorrow is greater than laughter because sorrow changes the countenance of the heart. I hate to say it, it's just written. It ain't, I didn't make that up. It's in the Bible. God knows that, that oftentimes when we're brought to this place of pain, we're usually bought, brought, that usually brings us to the place of God's power. You see, our pain leads us to God's power. And that's the way it's designed to be. So these men here now are renting their clothes there. How can this have happened to us, man? Desperate, desperate. Now, verse 14, and Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house. Now they're on the way back for he was yet there and they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said unto them, what deed is this that you have done? What ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine? <laughs> he look at him. He's just going with it. And Judah said, what shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? How shall we clear ourselves? Look at that. How many guys have been there? What? Who? What? Where? Lord? Why? That's what they're doing. How many of us have been in that position where God is working and moving and now we're going, what? What can I say? What can I do? Who can I talk? What, Lord? What have I done? What's going on? How should we clear ourselves? And here's this. This is a very interesting ver statement, what they're going to say next. Look what they say now after they're saying, what can we say? There's nothing we can do. Look what they say. God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. God has found out the iniquity of thy servants. So they're, they're, they're now look, notice their condition here. They're desperate. They're in despair. They're in fear. So their minds immediately go to what can we do? What can we say? How do we get out of this thing? And then that leads to God is punishing me. Because he knows my sin. 
God is punishing me because I'm a sinner and the sins we've committed in our lives. See, this is interesting. This is now where that perspective comes in. A lot of us end up at this point right here. God must be doing this because I'm a sinner. God must be doing this because I, I sinned. And you know what ends up happening after that? Your theology gets a little weird. Because what happens after that is, well, then I'm, I better go repent again. I better go get saved again. That, that must mean what I have to do. I better go to the harvest again and walk down to the thing. Maybe that's what I need to do now. Because maybe the first time I got saved didn't work. Maybe, maybe my, my forgiveness of my sins before. And, but notice, we always talk about this. We always say that our sins were forgiven. Which ones? The past ones, present ones, and the ones to come. You guys ever had that come out of your mouth? God has forgiven me for all my sin. But when you're in pain and you're in distress and you're in confusion, you will say, he must have not have forgiven me. He must be punishing me right now because of sin, something I've done. What can I do now? See, if our perspective of the Lord and of the word of God is where it should be, then you will know when these things happen that it's not that you're a sinner. He's, see, Jesus' blood is not that thin to where, oh, I, well, it, it covered you only for a couple years, but it's running out, and now you need more. Okay, so you better go get some more blood. Pour the communion juice on your face, you know, on Wednesday night, because you're doing something wrong. No, you know, and, and we say, okay, oh, well, I, I got to do something different. See, the blood of Christ has covered you it has made you perfect, man. It, is, it has sanctified you. It, it is, it's, what's, it's what's getting us into eternity. That's not, that's not something that comes and goes. God's not playing games. He didn't, he didn't make Jesus a game player. Well, let's see how they do it. I'm going to send my son. I'm going to let my only son die on the cross. And then I'm just going to let them bounce back and forth to see if it's really going to work. No. That's insane thinking. That would be a God of confusion. That would be a God that's vindictive. And that's not God. But see, our flesh goes, that can't be true, man. Because I'm messed up. I'm wretched. What I did, nobody should have done. What I said, nobody should have said. So no, that can't be me, man. I can't be that pure and that clean and that, you know. No, yeah, well, what you're doing, the reason why you're going there in your head is because you're allowing your distress, your frustration, your hurt, your confusion, you're allowing it to define your perspective of God and of his son, Jesus. And that is our mistake. That's their mistake right here. God is punishing us for what we've done in the past. And you know which one they're talking about. They're talking about Joseph. They're saying God is punishing us for what we did to Joseph. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. Verse 17. And he said, God forbid that I should do so. Okay, now this is, <laughs> watch this. But the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. Look, he's playing games, man. He's like, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to take all of you guys. No, no, you guys are good. It's whoever has the cup. <laughs> okay, that's who we're going to go after. He shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. <laughs> this is interesting now. This, this just gets better every verse. Now their situation went from dire to, to, to nightmare status. Because they're saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is the worst case scenario here. The worst case scenario for all of them would be that Benjamin stood there. <laughs> Okay, and Joseph's like, nah, we're good. I just want the one who's cup, the young one. That's it. <laughs> Nightmare, crisis time right now for them. God has allowed their minds and their situation to take them to the worst case scenario. Has anybody ever been there? Where, where you are actually feeling like you are at the worst case scenario of your life. Like God has actually allowed me to get to the worst. I actually didn't, I, I, you know, 
And this is, for example, these are, these are situations where I, I honestly didn't think, you know, maybe one of my biggest things was holding on to my job, you know. And, and my worst case scenario would be to have my family with young kids and to be jobless and po potentially homeless. Now that's God saying, you saying that to yourself. And then a situation happening in your life and you're now in the streets with your family. That's worst case scenario. You know, like that's your worst case scenario. But you know what's interesting <clears throat> is... I believe that God likes to bring us to these challenging situations where we might believe it's a worst case scenario. That way, when he comes in to intervene and change things, we, get, we know who to give the glory to. And now I think when, these, when we're brought to these situations like this, you now know who God is. Your, at one point in time might have been a twisted perspective of God is now going to be very understood, very clean and, and very concise. God is a God who intervenes. You know, I think about the children of Israel and I envy them sometimes. <laughs> Not considering 400 years of slavery and all that stuff, okay? But I envy them in a sense that like they got to see the Red Sea open, man. Like, can you imagine that? Can you imagine Long Beach? You have to get to Catalina, all of a sudden, <laughs> like, what? I would never doubt God for the rest of my life, right? That's what we say. Or, or he led them through the desert with, uh, with uh, fire by night and all this stuff and a cloud by day. I always think if I saw that, if God took me home Whittier, to Whittier with a, a cloud in the day and, and a fire by night, I, I would be the most solid believer you could think of, man. Like, I see God. I know who he is. Imagine seeing him on top of Mount Sinai all the time, you know, thunder and all this stuff. Moses going up and down and coming back with revelation. I'd be like, that's the mountain of God, man. He's up there. I know where he's at. I know exactly where to find him. I envy them because they saw God with their eyes and they heard him with, with their ears. And I'm always like, I wish that would happen. See, their perspective of God, I feel, was one that we all long for. Even the disciples, they got to walk with Jesus, man. Like in the streets. When I went to Israel, I'm like, Jesus was here. I don't feel it because, I, I mean, he was here a long time ago. Not here now. And it's probably really underground four times is where he really was. You know what I mean? Because everything's been buried for so many different things that have happened. And I'm like, but they were with him, man. Like, how can you have even doubt it if you're walking with Jesus? Their perspective. But what's interesting is, though they saw those things, they doubted God more than anything. They, they, they questioned his existence, his provision. You guys remember when they were in the wilderness and they said, God wasn't the one who brought us out of Egypt. It was, it was, it was something else. What? Are you kidding me? That was not even that long ago. It's all in the perspective. Yeah, that's where we need to say, Lord, help us to see you for who you really are. Help us to be able to have the right perspective in these times. So verse 18, let's, we could do this. So then Judah came near unto him and said, Oh, my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ear. And lot, let not thy anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. So here he is just kind of, that was a nice way of saying, let me, let me talk to you, you're the boss. My, now this is going to be sort of Judah's explanation. Let's follow it for a minute, okay? This is where we're going to read it all. My Lord asked his servants, meaning Joseph, you, Joseph you, you asked us, saying, Have ye a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one. And his brother is dead. And he alone is left of his mother, and his father loves him. And you said unto us, Bring him down unto me, that I may set my eyes upon him. And we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father. For if he should leave his father, his father would die. This is Judas telling a story. Verse 23. And thou sayest unto thy servants, except your youngest brother come down with you, ye shall see my face no more. This is what you told us to do, my Lord. And it came to pass when we came up unto thy servant, my father, we told him all the words that you said. And our father said, go again and buy us a little food. And we said to our father, we cannot go down if our youngest brother be with us, then will we go down? Like we can't go without him. For we may not see the man's face except our youngest brother be with us. So Judah, here he is, is telling the whole story. He's 
recounting everything that's going on. Verse 27. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, Ye know that my wife bare me two sons. He's telling Joseph, you know, the quote unquote, the master. He's telling him the whole story. And, and verse uh, 28. And the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces, and I saw him not since, speaking of Joseph. And if ye take this also from me, and mischief befall him, meaning Benjamin, ye shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. So what Judah's doing here is he's telling him, look, man, like, I need to tell you the whole story. Like, this is where I'm at right now, bro. Like, you told me to do this. You told us to do that. We told you what's going on with our father. We told you what would happen if we brought Benjamin. You know, he's just running the whole situation down as if to say, like, listen, man, like, let me tell you my testimony here, bro, and where we're at. Now, notice here, verse 30. Now, therefore, when I come to my, thy servant, my father, when I go back home and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, meaning he's only alive because of Benjamin, you know, it's his, it's his only joy. It shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die, man. And thy servants shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave. Listen, master, Lord, whatever he's calling him. If you do this, you're going to kill my dad. You're, if this happens, I might as well not even go home because the worst is going to happen with my father. This is how attached he is to Benjamin, the one you want to keep here. What's going on here is, is not necessarily we're recounting the story. What's happening is Joseph's hearing now the condition of his family and he's hearing what has changed. Because remember, we started this whole chapter off by saying, that we know the theme of the, the, the whole thing is the youngest brother. And we started this chapter off talking about, you know, he wanted to see the change of heart. That's what God wants, to see the change of heart. Now, in, in Judah's whole little statement here, Joseph is now hearing the change that has taken place in the lives of his brothers. He's hearing what their situation, and he's hearing what their trial, and he's hearing what has happened, what it's done to them who it's made them out to be. They actually care. Like, you remember when they were dealing with Joseph? They didn't care. You didn't hear none of them when they threw Joseph down in the pit go, man, guys, if we do this, we're really going to kill our father. You know, we're going to do it. They were just like, whatever. We'll just go tell our father that he died. They, they didn't have any real respect for their dad in that instance. They weren't thinking like that back then. But now they are. Now they're considering the whole situation. And they sound a lot wiser, if you will. They sound more desperate to protect their dad. They're pleading with him to save Benjamin. Save him. So much so, watch this, verse 32. For thy servant became surety when, uh, for the lad unto my father. I, I gave my life for his, uh, saying, if I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Verse 33. Now, therefore, I pray thee, let thy servant abide. Let me stay here and live with you instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brother. For how shall I go up to my father and the lad be not with me? Lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father. What Judah's saying here is something I think that's going to push a real heavy spot in Joseph's heart. What he's saying here is, bro, my life for his life. I will give my life for Benjamin. I, I will give my life for his. Please let me give my life. Just let him go. Joseph is hearing all of this at one point in time being betrayed by his brothers, being, being backstabbed in the most severe way, being let down in the most severe way, being, you guys know his life story. We read it together where that, situation took him in his life and all the crazy things he went through because of the brothers and how they treated him but now here they are saying for benjamin take my life man for his something has to happen in all of our lives that's going to make us be the opposite of who we used to be 
At one point in time, every one of us would say, you know what, I don't really care about this guy or I don't care about that guy. How many back before you guys were a Christian or before, you know, in your own time, and how many of you guys really cared about other people? <laughs> you know, maybe you cared about a few people here and there. You know, how about even in marriage? How often did you really, you know, my wife, yeah, she's cool, whatever, but, you know, it's about me. <laughs> you know, see, notice the transformation. Everything happens for a reason. Everything we're going through happens for a reason. And that primary reason is that God would transform you and renew your mind. And you're going through whatever you're going through and you go through whatever you go through because God is wanting to see a change. From this to that, you know, from, from not caring to caring, from not loving to loving, okay? To the point where you will even die for it. I will give my life for my brother, you say. But at one point, they didn't care anything about their brother. Notice how heavy the work of God can change us. And one thing we have to take away from this is you can't do this change on your own. This is something that God does. We can't do this. I, okay, you know what I'm going to do, man? I want to be someone who dies for my bro. See, I'm going to go and I'm going to go do this and I'm going to go work out a little bit too. And I'm going to, you know, uh, no, you, you can't do this. This is not a work of the flesh. This is a work of God. So embrace the trial. Embrace the change. Embrace the not knowing the end result. Embrace that. Rejoice in that. Uh, one of the biggest things I get when people come and pray with me is I pray that I would know what God is doing. You know what? I hate to say it sometimes. You're not always going to know what God is doing. We don't always know the end time. You know what? If I knew the end time of my trial, oh, I think I would sleep better. If I knew like on, you know, January 20th, 2025, that this is when that's gonna end, I, maybe I would just stay at home and wait for that day to come. If we knew the end time, oh, your kid is gonna be saved and become a missionary for the Lord on this day, you know what I mean? Or whatever, gosh, can you imagine that? But then where would our faith be? Where would our, where would we, and why would we be drawn to seek the Lord if we knew everything? So we're challenged, guys, and so are these guys here. But you know what? I think we're going to end with a really cool perspective. And that is this entire gnarly situation that they're going through has changed them. Joseph has changed. And now as we end this reading, the brothers have changed. Judah has changed. Their whole care and heart for their family has changed. And only God can do that. Only God can make that change. So... I totally forgot we have communion tonight. My gosh. I would have stopped a long time ago, man. You guys should have told me something. Let's pray. So, Father, we thank you for your word to us. And, Lord, thank you for speaking to us.